From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. This is Samuel Clemens speaking. Word comes to our colony of late residents of the United States that the art form known as the motion picture makes a pretty good thing of bringing the great American West to the attention of current inhabitants who are fortunate enough to live somewhere else. As I understand it, the movie makers have found three basic ingredients necessary to their presentation of life in the West. Ingredient one, scenery. Ingredient two, a good man in a white Stetson and a bad one with 10 gallons of black felt on his head. Ingredient three, a rousing chase over ingredient one and involving ingredient two. Of course, they add a few refinements now and then, such as the love of mankind for horse kind. Don't know what I'd do without you, broomtail partner. Or maybe a battle against the elements. Gotta keep moving. Ain't no little thing like a blizzard, a prairie fire, and a flood gonna stop me. And sometimes even a female. Come back when you can, Ranger. And thanks. Now, word has reached me that in addition to symphony orchestras, trick horses, and guitar players, they also hire writers just to think up these adult westerns. This seems a little silly to me since I wrote a book some 90 years ago which contains all the literary appurtenances necessary to make a western as adult as it should be. These writing fellows can find it in any library. Its title is Roughing It. And its author is yours truly, Samuel Clemens. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight by tape, the workshop offers to writers of Western films a do-it-yourself kit, through the courtesy of one of America's greatest humorists, Samuel Clemens. <laughs> Mind you, I don't consider myself an authority. It's just that I was there back in 1863. I happened my brother Bob was appointed secretary of the territory of Nevada, and I was pretty cut up about it. Pretty soon he would be hundreds of miles away on the great plains and deserts and mountains of the far west. He would see buffaloes and Indians and prairie dogs and antelopes. Maybe he would get hanged or scalped and write home and tell us all about it and be a hero. So when he offered me the sublime position of private secretary under him, it seemed the heavens and earth passed away and the firmament was rolled together as a scroll. I accepted. We left the States at St. Joseph, Missouri and headed west across the plains by fast stagecoach. Comfortable in there, gents? Yep. Maybe a bit crowded. If that pile of mail sacks topples loose, we'll be crowded right through the back of the coach. Yep. We got 2,700 pounds of mail aboard. Some are Salt Lake, Carson, and Frisco. Half of the heft of it is for the engines. Mail for the Indians? Oh, there's powerful, troublesome stuff. They get plenty of truck to read. It was a superb summer morning, and all the landscape was brilliant with sunshine. So I didn't give much thought to Indians, literate or illiterate. We felt there was only one complete and satisfying happiness in the world, and we had found it. We felt a lot different 12 hours later as we slashed through a prairie rainstorm. Whoa there! Whoa! Uh, Sam. Yes, Bob? What happened? Well, how should I... Hey, George, the thoroughbrace is broke! 
Just what I was going to say. Thorough brace? Is that part of a horse? Well, doubtless a vital part, a leg maybe. Well, how could a horse break a leg on a road this smooth? He may have been reaching around to bite the driver. You have to turn out a spell, gents. Thorough brace is broke. In all this rain? A little drizzle is all, won't melt you. Here, I'll hold the lantern so you can see the trouble. Here, is the animal in pain? Now, see that doggone strap connected to the other belt and spring contraption right there under the rear of the coach? Oh. Oh, say, I never saw a thorough brace used up like that before that I can remember. How did it happen? Yeah, it happened trying to make one coach carry three days' mail, that's how. Yeah, but it's lucky. <laughs> that to protect us from the engines. How so? Why, right here in this very spot is where I was supposed to leave that whole ton of newspapers for him. And it's so nation dark, I might have drove right by if the thoroughbrace hadn't broke. Hey, <laughs> Now, if I can ask you, gents, to help me toss out the sacks, I'll get on with mending it. Uh, when will the Indians pick up their mail? Uh, in the morning, maybe. Or next time they're along this way. All I know is that with all this fascinating reading matter, <laughs> they won't be bothering us. They didn't, and we enjoyed considerably more legroom in the stage. Fifty-six hours later, we crossed the Platte River and rattled into Fort Kearney in the territory of Nebraska, 300 miles out of St. Joe. 300 miles in 56 hours. But they went and spoiled it. They pushed the railroad out onto that beautiful prairie. And only 12 years later, they made the same 300 miles in less than 16 hours. And now I'm given to understand that this record has recently fallen to the newfangled flying machine. So it's no wonder that the fellows who make these Western movies never get a chance to find out what the West is really like. You gotta rock along a rutted trail at 12 miles an hour like we did to understand the country. Soon we acquired certain blisters. And when they became calluses, the seats became less hard. The driver of the stagecoach was perhaps the very first of a hardy breed. George Bemis was his name. Only nowadays you meet him as Gabby or Chill or Fuzzy or maybe the old timer. But if any of those Johnny-come-latelys think they can hold a candle to George Bemis, they'd better start burning it at both ends. Yes, yeah, Squaw's late getting back from the buffalo hunt. Well, here's that stupid horse's fault. The minute he saw that buffalo wheel on him, he raised straight up in the air and stood on his heels. Uh, he threw you? <clears throat> Takes more horse than him to throw George Bemis. Well, then a buffalo made another pass, and I may wish to die if the horse didn't stand on his head for a quarter of a minute and shed tears. But you stayed on through the flood. I stayed on. Uh, pretty soon, the buffalo made a snatch for us and brought away some of my horse's tail. Then you should have seen that spider-legged old skeleton of a horse go, and the buffalo cut out after him. Uh, which was faster? Well, I never did determine... But by George, it was a hot race. I and the saddle were back on the horse's rump, and I had to bridle in my teeth while holding on to the pommel with both hands. First, we left the dogs behind. Then we passed a jackrabbit. Then we overtook a coyote. And we were standing on an antelope when the saddle girth let go, and I landed about 30 yards off to the left at the foot of the only tree in nine counties adjacent. Buffalo come over to see if I was hurt. And one second after that, I was a straddle of the main limb. It was a little over 40 feet to the ground from where I sat. But you were safe. <clears throat> That's what a tenderfoot like you might assume, Mr. Clemens. But presently a thought come to that buffalo, and he started in to clumb that tree. What, the buffalo? Of course. Who else? But a buffalo can't climb a tree. He can't, can he? Hey, <laughs> uh, since you know so much about it, did you ever see one try? No. Well, then, the buffalo started to climb that tree. So I cautiously unwound the lariat from the pommel of my saddle. Your saddle? Did you take your saddle up the tree with you? Of course I didn't. It landed there when the horse kicked it, and it was falling off him when the girth let go. Oh, oh, I see. 
certainly. So I unwound the lariat and fastened one end of it to the limb. Higher and higher clumb that buffalo. He hitched his foot over the stump of a limb and looked at me as if to say, you are my meat friend. But buffaloes don't eat meat. Don't they, though? He was within ten feet of me, his eyes hot, his tongue hanging out. And by this time, I had one end of the lariat tied to the limb and the coil all ready. All of a sudden, I let go, and the slip noose fell fairly around his neck. Quicker than lightning, I was out with my revolver. Hey, that scared the buffalo, too. Must have. For when the smoke cleared away, he'd let loose his hold of the tree trunk, and there he was, dangling in the air 20 feet from the ground. So I shinnied down and headed for home. Well, that's uh, quite a story, Mr. Bemis. It's a little hard to swallow, but uh, still quite a story. You wouldn't care to doubt it, would you, young man? No, but... Uh... Did I bring back my lariat? No. Did I bring back my horse? No. Or my saddle? No. Well, then. There's something to be said for a liar on a long journey, though. A really good one makes the time pass more quickly. But 20 days is still 20 days. And that's how long it took us to reach Carson City, the capital of Nevada Territory. If you want to know what Carson City looked like back then, just try to recall the little town in high noon with those funny little white frame buildings that seemed too high to sit down on and hardly high enough for anything else. Carson was like that, and the same sort of things went on there as Gary Cooper and the princess and all the other fine people acted out. But as I recall, the action at Carson City moved toward its climax without benefit of that old clock on the wall. And there was action. It began the moment we climbed down from the stagecoach. A tall, rangy fellow that might have been Gary's granddad rode up and shook hands with us from the lofty turret of his saddle. Good afternoon. I take it you're Mr. Clemens, the new secretary. I am, sir. And this is my brother, Sam. I'm deeply pleased to welcome you. I'm Mr. Harris. The governor sent me to meet you. Well, now, that's oh, mighty... Uh, um, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to excuse me a minute. Yonder is the witness who swore I helped rob the California coach some weeks ago. A piece of impertinent meddling, gentlemen, for I'm not even acquainted with the man. Get up there! Whoa! Now, gentlemen, if there is any way I may be of service. I never saw Mr. Harris shoot down a man after that without recalling my first day in Carson City. I was wonderfully fascinated with the curious new country, and I set about to become a real Westerner. Now, every Westerner must have a horse to ride, a noble, intelligent, friendly beast, which I understand, according to routine film procedures, must be acquired by saving it in colt hood from a stock shot of a cougar, or at very least from a mob of blackguards bent on thwarting the SPCA. But that is the hard way to get a horse. Twenty dollars I am bid for this noble beast. Friends, don't hurt the animal's pride. Now, do I hear twenty-two? It looks like that one's going pretty cheap, don't it, Strange? Well, I'm not too familiar with the local market. Saddle alone's worth the money. Friends, who make it twenty-two? <laughs> Twenty-two. Twenty-two dollars I'm bid, and it's still a steal in the crying shape. I'm well, I was about to bid myself, but if you want him... Uh... I don't really want him. I wouldn't know what to do with another horse. It's just that I know this one. I know him well. Oh? Now, you might think he was an American horse. Well, he's nothing of the kind. Going, going... Twenty-four. Twenty-four is bid, thank you, so only twenty-four for this magnificent super uh, Excuse my speaking in a low now, voice, stranger, other people being hand. near and all that, but he is, without a shadow of a doubt, a genuine Mexican plug. Really? Yes, sir, a genuine Mexican plug. 
I only wish I could use him. See, why don't you bid on him? Oh, has he any other advantages? Oh, yeah, 24 and a half. He can outbuck anything in America. You're sure you don't want him? No, 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 no. I wish I did. You go right ahead, sir. 24 and a half, three times. Uh, uh, 27. Soul, soul, come and get him, friend. Congratulations, stranger. <laughs> you always get a bargain when my brother auctions off a horse. Certain citizens held my genuine Mexican plug by the head and others by the tail while I mounted him. As soon as they let go, he placed all his feet in a bunch together, lowered his back, then suddenly arched it upward and shot me straight into the air. The third time I went up, I heard my new friend say, Oh, don't he buck, though. And when I came down again, the genuine Mexican plug was not there. He darted away like a telegram, soared over three fences like a bird, and disappeared down the road toward the Washoe Valley. I sat down on a stone with a sigh. One of my hands sought my forehead, the other the base of my stomach. I never appreciated till then the poverty of the human machine, for I still needed a hand or two to place elsewhere. And subsequent events, as you shall see, convinced me that the movie maker perhaps is inclined to romanticize the horse's usefulness to man. Now, this was the time of the great silver fever. John Wayne himself searched for the Comanche no more avidly or in deeper snow than the inhabitants of Nevada searched for hidden wealth. I succumbed and joined a prospecting party consisting of a Mr. Ballou, a Mr. Ollendorf, me, and three miserable horses. We rode out of Carson on a chilly December afternoon. And some days later... Move! Now, come along here, you spraying monster! Move! Now, mine doesn't pull any easier than yours, Baloo. Uh, this one pulls even harder yet. Uh, maybe they don't like it, the snow. I don't like it, the snow either, Ollendorf. Yeah, we should have stayed at the stage station another day or two, maybe. Till we could see where we was going. My head, it is like a compass. Exactly where we are going... I know by instinct. Well, now, that's splendid news. The last four hours would have been happier if you'd told us four hours ago. My instinct sets a beeline. If we was to waver off that beeline a single degree of the compass, my instinct, she would say, whoa! I didn't mean you, whoa. I meant myself, whoa. Come, horse. Oh, we should have traveled with a party left before us this morning. I rather wish we had. Oh, but here are the tracks of that party. Say, they are tracks of that. So, we hurry and catch up with them. <laughs> I told you my head, it is like a compass. Come, horse. We must be catching them. Tracks look fresher. Yeah, there seems to be more of them. Maybe some others also have joined the party. Come, horse. More people joining a party all the time. I wonder how such a large group of people can be so quiet. Well, maybe they don't like each other. Uh, come, horse. Enough tracks now for a platoon of soldiers. A regiment yet. Any minute we catch up with them. Yeah, any minute. We... Uh, boys, wait. These here's our own tracks. We've been circusing around in a confounded circle for the last two hours. What? Well, certainly we have. Not a very big circle of that. But my head, it is like a compass. Ollendorf, your head, it is like a rock. You horsey, horsey, horsey. Oh, Clemens, if you hadn't used up all them matches... Well, if you hadn't got the fool notion that frozen sagebrush would burn... Well, if you hadn't dropped the bridles and lost the horses when all north tried to light the fire by shooting his pistol into it... Yeah, you horsey, horsey, horsey. Well, if horses would stay by their master's sides through thick and thin like those lying books say they yeah, do... If you hadn't overslept this morning so we could have joined that other party... If Ollendorf hadn't led us around and around in boys, circles, I... Boys, boys, I... boys. Let us die without hard feelings toward each other. Let us forgive and forget bygones. 
Maybe you have felt hard toward me. Well, I have felt hard toward you too. You are both a couple of doomcocks. But I forgive you. I forgive you with all my heart. You know something, Orndorff? You make me ashamed of myself. Now, you are a pompous Prussian ass. Yeah. But I forgive you too. Baloo, Ollendorf, I hadn't traveled one mile with you before I decided you were the biggest bores the maker ever created. Yeah. But I forgive both of you. Well, thanks. I could not die with two finer gentlemen. Well, let's shake hands and then lie down in the snow. And in the morning, well, we'll be frozen to death. Yeah. They say that freezing to death is the most happiest way to die. That's what they say. So long, Ovida Sein. Goodbye. A delicious dreaminess wove its web about my yielding senses. The snowflakes wove a winding sheet about my conquered body. Oblivion came. We woke in the gray dawn, and not 15 feet away, under the shed of the stage station, stood our noble horses. It's no fault of theirs that I ever got back to Carson City and continued my research on the mores and peoples of the West. It was a grueling job, and when I became so physically exhausted that I felt the need of a bit of spiritus frumenti to rub on my corns, I would repair to an establishment noted for its medicinal hospitality. Now, I have no quarrel with the Hollywood notion that ruffians are found in saloons. I have no quarrel with calling these ignoble creatures by the names of states, such as Montana, Texas, or Black Bart. But I do quarrel with their idea of the raw passions that ignite a barroom quarrel. And I give them Arkansas. Come on, our landlord, you can get that bottle on the bar faster than that, can't you? Uh, no offense, Mr. Arkansas. There's other guests in the place, too, you know. I got eyes. <laughs> there you are. Your second bottle today, Mr. Arkansas. Put this one on my bill, too. Well, now. I was reading about Pennsylvania election, and I reckon it Oh, looks what do you know about Pennsylvania? Answer me that, Johnson. What do you know about Pennsylvania? Well, I was only going to say you that you were. Don't... What was you going to say? That's what I want to know. Yeah, repeat what you were saying about Pennsylvania, if you dare. Why, well, I was only going to say that Pennsylvania was going to have election next week. That was all I was going to say. I wish I, I may never stir if it wasn't. And why don't you say it? What'd you come swelling around that way for, trying to raise trouble? Well, I didn't come swelling around, Mr. Arkansas. I was already here because I own this place, and I just Oh, meant... so I'm a lie, am I? Now, please. Now, now please. I, I never meant such a thing as that. I got ears. Any man calls me a liar. Oh, now, come on now, Mr. Arkansas. Let's take a drink together. Let's shake hands and take a drink. Well... Now that you put it that way. Well, come on up, everybody. It's my treat. <laughs> Bill, Tom, Bob, Baloo, come on up. Yeah, just leave the bottle. I want you all to take a drink with me in Arkansas. Old Arkansas, I call him. Give me your hand again, old Arkansas. Yeah. Give me that old flipper again. As <laughs> long as you say so, and as long as you're buying. Why, sure, <laughs> sure. Hey, drink up there, Baloo. Oh, say, by the way, how's your father? And not so good. You know, my father was upwards of 80 year old when he passed away, and if he hadn't... Landlord, will you please make that remark over again, if you please? Why, well, I was just saying to Balu that my father was upwards of 80 year old when he died. Was that all you said? Yeah, that was all. You didn't say nothing about that? No, nothing. Look, what's the idea of ricking up old personalities and blowing about your father? Ain't this crowd agreeable to you? Well, of course this crowd If this crowd ain't agreeable to you, perhaps we'd better leave. Is that your idea? Why, bless your soul, Arkansas. I wasn't thinking of such a thing. I only said that my father... Landlord, don't crowd a man. Don't do it. Don't rake up old bygones and throw them in the teeth of a pass with people who wants to be peaceful if they could get a chance. What's the matter with you today, anyway? Well, Arkansas, I really didn't mean no harm. 
But with so many customers, a man's got to give each one a well, little. Well, that's what's rankling your heart, is it? Too many customers. You want us to leave, is that it? Now, please, please be reasonable, Arkansas. You know I ain't a man. Come out from behind that bar. Yeah. Oh. Now, please, Arkansas, p please, please, please don't shoot. If there's got to be blood, So it's blood you want, you raven desperado. You made up your mind to murder somebody today, and it's me you got in mind, eh? No, Arkansas. Well, you Arkansas. can't do that. I get one chance first, you thieving, black-hearted, white-livered son of a sea cook. Draw your weapon. Now, wait, Arkansas. <laughs> Let me see Hollywood stop that one without rivers of blood and mothers dragging their screaming offspring from the theaters, never to return. Hollywood would never think the carnage could be halted by the tender words and frail beauty of the pioneer woman, would it? What's going on in here? Johnson, what do you mean stumbling through our nice glass door that way? And who's doing that shooting? Who's causing all this? Oh, it's you, is it, Arkansas? Well, Mrs. Johnson, I didn't mean Don't to... tell me what you mean. You're the only one with shooting iron smoking. Well, when a man can't hold more than two, three quarts of whiskey without he has to disturb a poor woman who's slaving her life away over a boiling hot range, trying to prepare a few vittles to keep the customers from starving themselves to death and causing her clumsy oaf of a husband to smash himself through a lovely glass door, which we only had shipped clear out here to make the place a little mite more like things was back in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Well... You fire off that pistol once more, and I'll run this butcher knife clean down from your guzzle to your boots. Do I make myself clear? Yes, am All right. Now do your drinking peaceable. All right, dear. There's lots more in my book. The real information about the West. Information appears to stew out of me naturally, like precious otter of roses out of the otter. So as I previously remarked, any writing fellas contemplating an adult western can find the book in the public library. Its title is Roughing It, and its author is yours truly, Samuel Clemens. <laughs> The CBS Radio Workshop, produced and transcribed in Hollywood by William N. Robeson, has tonight presented Roughing It by Samuel Clemens, adapted for radio by Francis Van Hartisfelt, and directed by Mr. Robeson. Louis Van Ruten was heard as Sam Clemens. Included in the cast were D.J. Thompson, Eddie Marr, Dawes Butler, Peter Leeds, Howard McNear, Jack Crucian, Hal Perry, and Junius Matthews. The original score was composed and conducted by Amerigo Marino. <laughs> Next week, the workshop will be heard from New York in a demonstration of a writer at work by and with Hector Chevney, author of the daytime serial, The Second Mrs. Burton. Looking for a shortcut to satisfaction, there's nothing quite as satisfactory as knowing you've accomplished a good deed. And when you do that good deed through your United Community Fund, you really are taking that shortcut. When you're thinking about lending your support to the United Fund in your town, CBS Radio hopes you'll remember that the United Fund is a way to help many worthwhile efforts with just one gesture on your part. Mm -hmm.